Francisco Fernandez, welcome to CNN Money Switzerland. You are the chairman of Avalog, and this is where we are sitting right now. You were the founder of the company, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about another of your passions, which is Formula V, and many people won't have even heard of that yet. What is it? That's pretty new. Actually, the launch event should be somewhere in Q1, 19. Um, and the idea is to digitalize formula car racing uh, or, or car racing in general. Um, so the V doesn't stand for the five. V st <laughs> the V <laughs> stands for, f for virtual. It's, it's virtual car racing because it's uh, the idea to um, have, it's, it's actually gaming sports, eSports is about gaming. But when you hear gaming, you think about a console-based game. So you sit at home at your PC and you have a mouse, potentially a small steering wheel and the keyboard. And um, this is not near enough to what I call high fidelity. So to be with your gaming as near to reality as possible. So, so what we do- Explain to me what, what this is then. Yes, okay, so what we do is we, we have a, a hardware which looks similar to a Formula One car and you have a one-to-one -one Formula One steering wheel and uh, you have feedback from that box that you feel like you're driving. When you sit on a, in front of a PC, you don't feel that, like you're driving. On, on a car simulator, like we will have it in Formula V, you have really the physical impression of you are driving. Okay, so, so this is a nearer. level up from a normal simulator that you might see in, in any kind of games hall. Uh, yes, normally it, it, it's a high-end version of this, uh, a, a version, a, a simulator that you would also say that real formula drivers uh, would get an effect in training on these things because um, uh, uh, a training day on a Formula One car costs above a million and a training day on a simulator can be a, hop, a, a couple of uh, thousand dollars, which is much, much, much uh, cheaper. Uh, and the other thing is that um, it, it's riskless. I mean, you can have an accident in the simulator, nothing happens to you. Uh, so it's also an entry for the masses. We, by digitalizing car racing with simulators, uh, you can make it accessible to the masses. So you can make a mass sports out of an elite sport. If you look at Formula One, they have 20 athletes. In simulator, we can have 200 million of athletes. So tell me, how is it going to work then? You're going to have how many of these Formula V cars? Mm, right now, we plan to um, create training centers. We call them racing lounges. We have four simulators to 10 simulators per lounge where you can not only train yourself on a racetrack to get used to the track, to where to brake, where to accelerate, how to uh, maneuver the car, but also race against each other. So it's already a sport. Mm -hmm. Instead of playing tennis or whatever, you can play car racing with a, a physical experience in these uh, racing lounges, in these centers. And we plan very similar to um, fitness centers like uh, Holmes Place or any other fitness center brand with franchises. So uh, the vision is to have in all big cities in the world a couple of such centers where people can go and train. And uh, you will have different division levels. You will have uh, casual gamers that just go there for fun instead of going to the discotheque. You can go with your girl to impress your girl to the to the racing lounge or you know to have fun with your friends. And then you will have also better physical. How much of your background, though, in fintech has uh, is involved in this, or is it this a completely new chapter for you? Let's say car racing is a new chapter, although it's uh, one of my favorite sports. While others watch tennis or soccer or are soccer fans or, or whatever, um, I was uh, uh, always a little bit into car racing. You know, I watch regularly uh, DTM. Formula One and, uh, and other car racing formats. Um, and you know what, what is common to all the companies I do is, uh, for me it's fun to create companies and build companies, grow companies. Um, 
and uh, the common ground is also it's all about digital. You know, if I can use my software engineering skills with the skills of how to build and grow companies um, uh, together with, you know, the new thing, which is, you know, you know let's say car racing and, 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 and uh, emotions or B2C instead of B2B, that was a fantastic opportunity for me. I understand you have quite a few passions that you follow. What other interests do you have? Mm, I mean, it's uh, publicly known that I am also into music. I play myself uh, piano. I could have, you know, uh, also engaged in, 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 in music. It's also about emotions. It's also B2C. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but somehow for me, uh, I don't want to make music digital. Music for me is unplugged. Is a human with an unplugged, non-electric instrument. That's where my passion is. So I'm more into classical music and jazz. So I could not combine that with a, let's say software engineering skill sets. For me, music and engineering is, is separate. It's a separate world, and, and that's good because it's, uh, you know, it's I heard the, the other part of the... I heard on the, the grapevine that actually you take <coughs> your piano playing very seriously and it's kind of don't disturb you while you're playing piano, is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's true because <laughs> it, it needs uh, um, intensity, you need to concentrate. I mean, your brain is working at full speed when you're playing the piano or even improvising, uh, uh, your brain is working at full speed. It, it, you know, you don't have room to think on something else while, you, while you're doing serious music. Is it always jazz for you? No, no, I said uh, classic and jazz. You know, I've played myself through all the genres. I started with 13 years of uh, classic piano. Then I had a band for four years in rock music. Then we went into reggae and uh, funk, and I ended up in, in, in Latin jazz. And where do you think this passion for music comes from? Do you have a background? Does your family have a background? Were you exposed to music mm, at a young age or anything? Not at all. So. Must be a DNA thing. <laughs> Tell us about your background. Uh, are you, you, both of your parents are Spanish, is that right? Yes, yes, they immigrated 60 years ago. Okay, but you are... You I, I, I was born here in Switzerland and grew up in Switzerland. And um, I knew Spain only as a um, holiday destination. And uh, now I'm going more often, you know, since the first 16 years of my life, I had to go to Spain for <laughs> holidays. <laughs> Always the same place, to Madrid. Now you can choose and, you to know, go. Now I can choose to go, absolutely. Um, you were one of the first to kind of uh, do you, focus your education in technology. Am I right in saying that? You, I mean, you yes. were very early on in, in that whole genre. Uh, Did you see yes. the potential? I was one of the first generation that grew up with computers. Although, um, you know, uh, when I was young, the, the computers was, you know, just a, 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 a pocket uh, ki a type of uh, calculator. Mm -hmm. But I grew up with that machine, which was, you know, fascinating and new. I have one of the first um, uh, uh, calculators with a, a, a small magne magnetic stripe, and you could program. So uh, once I understood the maths, I could program this, and then the machine would, you know, repeat it at uh, at, at at light speed, and that was fascinating. That you can uh, tell machines what to do, and they can repeat it. It's it's, a, it's about efficiency. It was about steering machines. I mean, this 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 is also a passion I have. Do you feel and like I grew I grew up with this? So, so um, probably you don't call a fifty year old a digital native. But we consider ourselves as, as being actually digital natives because we grew up with a computer. So the computer grew with us. Do you feel like a trailblazer in that regard? You know, you could kind of at the forefront. Yeah, you could say, you could say so. You know, it was fascinating. The, the computers were having an impact on us, on society. But we were also shaping the future, being the first generation that um, you know knew how to use the technology to to, to shape the future and shape the uh, behavior of society. Uh, here at Avalok, I mean, you've always been very hands-on with this company because I mean, you've, you you founded it and you've taken a kind of step back. You're now chairman, um, no longer CEO since the beginning of this year. How how has that been for you? Yeah, it's still a learning curve, <laughs> I would say. I bet. Um, <laughs> You know, having run the company 
uh, operationally execu in an executive role for 26 years. Uh, it's you know new experience for me too, but I focus on um, on areas where I think they think I, I have much uh, a higher lever or I can bring more value, add more value to the company, um, uh, focusing on strategy, M and A, um, uh, innovation management, and preparing for for an IPO. So, do you still feel like you're very much part of things here? Yeah, of course, of course. Me, me too. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about Avalok and the the IPO that you mentioned. Um, I read recently, actually, your new CEO, your Kunzaga, saying that actually you guys are ready to go public now, but you don't want to, not yet. Why yeah. is that? Um, you know, I refused already 2001 when everybody, you know, in the, the, the internet bubble, uh, all my colleagues said, hey, Francisco, let's go public. I said, I always refused to go premature public. Um, uh, and right now we are in a transformation from, I, we've been selling software on premise. Uh, so we have installed our software at 150 banks. And the industry is moving away from selling products, software products to selling services, um, going the direction of SaaS, software as a service. And we go even beyond uh, delivering process as a service, using our software platform to, de uh, to, to deliver banking services to banks. And right now we, we still do both. We still s sell software on premise, but our strategy is to go uh, SaaS and BPaaS. And if you're in the middle of such a transformation, that's difficult to explain to investors. Uh, and you know, an IPO story should be compelling, but also simple. Um, you know, to to be able to to explain that to, let's say, non-industry uh, savvy investors as well. So. I would like to, to have concluded this transformation, which means that, let's say, 90% of the revenue should come out of the BPAS and SaaS business, which is not the case uh, today yet. Uh, we are at, let's say, 60, 65% coming out of the new strategy. Um, and, and, and we need to further, further develop that to have a clear messaging to the investors. Do you have a time frame in mind then? Yes, we said earliest in three years, latest in five. So I have an internal benchmark that before I'm 60, I would like to see that happening. You talk about software as a service. Um, is that the way that fintech is going now for everyone or just for Avalok? Mm, no, no, uh, the whole software industry is going a, a way of, you know, selling software and teach the customers to deal with that software. Um, many customers, it's not their core business to deal with software. They, they have their businesses. Let, let's talk about a bank. A banker should be doing banking, taking care about making the right investment decisions and advising the customers. And it's not the core competence of a bank to write software or to operate software. So the industry, uh, together with cloud technologies and uh, the race of the internet has, has made it possible that the editors of software take care of their own software because they are just more professional in doing so and just deliver the outcome of the software and deliver that through the internet. So if you want to, 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 to use a complex software, the only thing you need is just a browser. So you, you, could, you, you could access the most complex software just by a tablet. So that's all you need because servicing and operating the software is happening elsewhere in a data center and you, you don't even have to know where that data center is. That's what they call cloud. How, how much um, do, you, do you put into research and development and innovation in order to stay ahead of competitors, in order to s remain ahead in this industry? Uh, a double digit number of the revenues, which is quite high. Um, so a high double digit number. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're often compared, I'm sorry to bring this up, but to Timenos. Um, how do you feel about that um, comparison? Is it a, is it a healthy kind of um, Usually competition I don't between I, you? I, I don't talk about competition. I respect competition. You always have competition. Uh, we have our own strategy, a complete different strategy. We are more into SaaS and BPaaS. Um, we 
see ourselves as innovators, shaping the industry, trying to uh, be an early adopter of new technologies. Right now, for example, we will incorporate uh, blockchain capabilities, having the um, normal assets like stocks and bonds, what we call fiat assets and fiat currencies, and crypto assets and cryptocurrencies in the same banking system. Right now, these worlds are completely apart. You have your Bitcoin wallet on your mobile, quite unsecure uh, and completely separate from your bank account. Today, you cannot call your bank and say, open a dollar account, a pound account, and an Ether account or a Bitcoin account. The banks would say, oh, I don't know how to do that. So you have separate institutes uh, uh, or companies to deal with crypto and regulated banks to deal with non-crypto or with the, f the fiat assets. We will be probably the first integrating that in one regulated bank account. How do you feel so, about so, these so that's, that's, that's why, why I say we, we try to understand technology and we understand banking and, and, and we are early adopter of the pot uh, potential that arises from, from new technology. And how do you feel about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general? Mm, you know, there are many um, people that are afraid of these new things, and this is a natural thing, you know, people are always afraid of disruptive innovations. Uh, and there are a lot of people who, who's, who said already since 10 years, Bitcoin is going to die, still here, <laughs> 10 years later. For sure. So I don't believe that this is, this is going to die. The blockchain technology is simple uh, and genius, and this will not disappear. If you watch the industry, um, new applications are coming up every day. Um, uh, that industry and, and that technology is growing everywhere. It has hundreds of thousands of, of sensible applications. And um, I think we should embrace these new technologies. Um, if you read research papers, you know, from McKinsey, IDC, Gartner and whoever, um, I read articles that say in five years time, five to 10% of, of GDP uh, will be in, uh, uh, allocated in tokens. So in crypto, crypto assets. And there is no reason why a, a, an IBM stock or a Nestle stock shouldn't be tokenized and have a digital representation because you could trade and settle that uh, in, in seconds. Today, it takes three days. If you, t if, you, if you call your bank and want to buy a Nestle stock, you will have it in, in your portfolio three days later. Actually, with the blockchain technologies, you could do that within seconds. And so what does the future hold then for Avalok? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I still think that we are a compelling um, uh, growth story. Um, as I said, uh, we go away from pushing software to delivering services. That transformation um, is in the strategy and we are um, consistently um, uh, executing that, that strategy. And um, <clears throat> I think the those disruptive new technologies like blockchain, te um, uh, tokenization, but also new models of uh, risk management, new financial mathematics, etc. Um, all these new technologies and, and opportunities are reshaping um, uh, the financial industry. Um, we are also including the end customer into the value chain. You know, 10 years ago, we let the bank do the payments. Today, we do it you know, uh, on our mobile devices ourselves. So it goes more into self-service. It, it is the inclusion of, of, of the customer into the, in, into the value chain of, of financial services, the dialogue between the bank or banking services and, and the end customer uh, is being completely transformed. And, and, and we are in, in best positioned to, to shape that future of, you know, new type of banking. And just finally, um, a comment on your relationship with Raiffeisen. Um, you have been working to complete that contract for, for some time. And recently I read you're 95% there and it's pretty much going to be finished by the end of this year. Are you still on track for that? Yes, very much so. I'm quite confident two weeks ago, another 60, uh, now 36 banks have migrated on, on, on our platform without any noise. 
uh, in two weeks you will see another 50 banks jumping on our platform. I mean, it's, it's, right now it's running fantastic, almost, almost too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we we're still confident that we can conclude the project until end of the year. It was um, a very complex uh, project, as you can imagine, 260 banks having their own installation of software, migrating that on, on a highly scalable single platform. Uh, it's quite um, a monster project, but uh, we're happy to, to conclude it at the end of the year. Okay, Francisco Fernandez, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you.